all of our offices, everyone here, are hearing from our constituents who are worried about the surge of crime and have been asking questions about our criminal justice system. The volume of information that's been coming across social media is sparking a lot of questions that require and deserve answers. So we're hosting this seminar in the midst of an Omicron surge. Uh, honestly, I would have preferred to have had this in person, but um, this is the best way to disseminate information. Um, and we're hoping to provide you with more context. So the issue of electronic monitoring has come up uh, on social media a lot, which is why we decided to invite our, our fine sheriff, Sheriff Tom Dart, to give us some straight talk. He is the person responsible for overseeing and tracking electronic monitoring. Um, when he was in the General Assembly, he chaired the Judiciary Committee in the Illinois House where I served with him. And we're hoping tonight he can help us separate some facts from myth and fiction. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Sheriff Tom Dart to talk to us about the electronic monitoring system. Take it away, Tom. So uh, Sarah, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for uh, participating tonight. As Sarah mentioned, uh, I don't know if there's any issue other than you know COVID that gets as much attention in our city than crime. And whether we're talking about carjackings, whether we're talking about the shootings, um, it's on everyone's lips and it should be. And it's not much solace to anyone, frankly, that you know the spikes are going on all around the country. This is our city and we're all very, very concerned. And so tonight I wanted to just talk about a couple of the different aspects of it. But the whole monitoring, you have to put it in perspective of where it fits into everything because you hear the word and uh, most normal people don't have any real understanding of what it is other than the general concept. Uh, for starters, as sheriff, we're in charge of the jail. And the jail, when I first became sheriff in 2006, we had about 11,000 some people in custody on an average day. Um, probably about eight, 900 people on home monitoring, electronic monitoring, call it what you want. Um, since probably 2018, uh, 2019 for sure, our jail population, so before COVID, our jail population had already dropped to about 5,500 in custody. So it had gone from 11,000 to 5,500, which was a tremendous drop um, of people in custody. My electronic monitoring population, though, did go up. It went up from about 1,000 to about uh, 2,500 in that range before COVID hit. Um, that, that's just to give you a perspective of the incarceration side of things here. So there has been that big change that has occurred as far as people being incarcerated or not. Uh, myself and many other people talked about our system incarcerating poor people routinely, mentally ill routinely, and some great changes were made to, to reduce that to next to nothing. Um, our concerns now are some of the people that have been released and whether or not they should be appropriately released. Electronic monitoring gets a lot of the attention recently, and it's a concept a lot of people don't fully understand. So to put it in perspective, once again, where did it come from? Well, back in 1980s, okay, and probably a little before that, there was tremendous overcrowding at the Cook County Jail. And as a result of that, courts ordered the sheriff to start just releasing people. And so the sheriff at the time thought that was not responsible. So it was ordered to release them, but decided he was going to put uh, bracelets on people to release them. So that's where the program came from. That's what the sheriff was doing at the time. Uh, when I became sheriff uh, in 2006, uh, I was of the firmest opinion that me, the sheriff, deciding who was getting home monitoring was, was reckless because it made no sense. I had barely, I had a DOS-based computer system, so I could barely tell you who was in the place at the time. My predecessor was great in getting the money for the computers to be upgraded and the like, but anyway, you cut it. Every other jurisdiction in the country that had home monitoring had the judges selecting who goes on home monitoring. The reason being, it makes more sense. They're in the courtroom. They hear both sides of the argument, why this person is a risk or not a risk and so on. So after many, many years of a struggle with the judiciary, I was able to get the judiciary to take over running the electronic monitoring program. And what I mean by running it, the judges since 2011 have been the ones selecting people for home monitoring. 
And so I literally have no more say than any of you folks do on who goes on home monitoring. I administer the program with who I am given. And so since 2011, they were putting people out, but they tended to be the same people that had been out prior to that, which were people primarily charged with drug offenses because home monitoring at that time was just a RF, which meant that you had a device on your leg and all it told you is if you're in the house or out of the house. And so because of that, you did not want violent people on home monitoring because all you could do is tell if they're in a house or not. And so the program had always been nonviolent offenders. When the judges took it over in 2011, for the most part, it stayed at nonviolent offenders. Uh, the populations went up and down. At one point, I dropped down to 500 people on home monitoring. But then prior to around 2017, there was a major change. And once again, this gets into a little bit of a nuance, but it's very significant because there's been lots of talk about the criminal justice reform, bond reform, and all the rest of it that's going on and went on last year and is going on forward. Well, prior to that, in 2017, the judiciary decided they were gonna completely revamp how they did bails in, um, in this county. And so the bond court got completely revamped. They brought in new judges that came up with a new order. And that order was to make it so that people were being uh, more properly, their inquiry were made of how much money they could afford to get out on bond if they set a bond. Before, and I used to be a prosecutor for many years, uh, many years ago, for five years, um, the, by and large, you would see loads and loads of bonds for uh, 100,000, 500,000, you know, you'd see crazy amounts like that. Well, that stopped happening because in 2017, they changed the way they did bonds. And that was reflected in the fact that my jail population started dramatically dropping. That's when it really started dropping because it was hovering around eight or 9,000 people at that time. It started then dropping to where it got to the point where it has been pretty much the same now for three years. So even before COVID, it had dropped to about 5,500 people in custody. And that was as a result of these changes in the bond court. With the changes, many more people were given I-bonds. I-bonds are an individual comes in front of a judge and they do not have to put any money up. They just have to sign their name basically. And so I-bonds went from about 26% of the people that came into court to 56 or 58% of the people coming to court were getting I-bonds. In addition to it, there was a little bit of an increase in home monitoring, electronic monitoring. The big difference though, folks, and which I'm talking about today is the type of person that went on home monitoring went from being what traditionally was people charged with drug offenses and the like to people charged with violent offenses. And so whereas it was a complete anomaly for me to have someone with a violent offense charge, all of a sudden I started seeing more and more people sent to my home monitoring program that were charged with gun offenses, uh, temp murder, even murders as well. Um, and they started being sent to my, um, my office to monitor them. I explained to the judiciary, this is not what the program was for. Uh, we shouldn't be doing this. They were still sending them to me. So I stopped putting people out. And I said, this is not what the program's for. I then was sued in, in federal court to force me to put people out. And I lost that suit and I was forced to put people out. And so I have been doing since that time, which was about three years ago, four years ago, um, was when I get the court order, I put people out. And that's because that's what I've been informed that I must do via the court orders that I'm given. Um, understanding that I'm getting a more violent groups of people coming out, we brought in the University of Chicago to help us in doing this in a different way. Everybody who goes out now is on a GPS monitor. They're monitored 24 hours a day right now. Um, and with the help of University of Chicago, we use all sorts of analytics to not just ensure people are where they're supposed to be, but to also use the analytics to see if they have any patterns or anything that's relevant to crimes that are occurring in different areas. And we partner up with all the different law enforcement agencies, as you can imagine, to make sure that we're on the same page in regards to that. And so that's been pretty much how we have been adjusting as well as we can with this. I've still been consistently saying that home monitoring is not a program for people charged with violent offenses. But what I was informed is, is the judiciary, once they made their changes in how they were going to put, in, uh, put bonds out, they felt that home monitoring was a safety valve. So that if they were putting people out that were more violent, at least they were now being monitored with a bracelet. 
And so that is what we have been doing. There were some new changes in the, the laws recently that one of them just went into effect a few days ago, which now requires me to give individuals movement, uh, free movement uh, twice a week, meaning that they can go where they want to go and do what they want to do for basically it's about eight, eight or 10 hours uh, a day, twice a week. Um, which is very different than before. Before, the only movement people on home monitoring got was what the judge ordered me to do. So the judge in his order for home monitoring said, Tom, you have to let the guy go to school every day. We would do that, but what we do, we'd have an individual run that out. We'd call the school, make sure that that was legit. We'd make sure what the, the route was to get to the school. We'd put a time element attached to it with some wiggle room, not a lot, to know that it took you from point A to point B a certain amount of time. This change in the law now will have two days a week where we're not doing that. We're not checking any of this out because we've been ordered to just allow them, uh, people on home monitoring to, to go where they want to go during those two days. So that that's going to be a bit of a change um, as a result of some of the recent changes as well. On an average uh, day, we usually have out of the 20, we're about, about now 2,600 people on home monitoring, which mind you makes us the largest in the, the country by far. Um, of the 2,600, we usually have about 400 and some people with court-ordered movement during the course of the day. But as they say, we monitor that and we make sure people stay on the paths that they're supposed to be going and so on. I have 2,600. There's another home monitoring program that's operating at the exact same time that is operated by the chief judge's office. Um, that program, we do not know how many people are on that program. Um, we think it could be a thousand. We're not sure. Um, the chief judge's office won't tell us how many people are on the program. Um, we are uh, believe most of them are on the old devices, which just tell you if you're in the house or not. And they're only monitored from 7 p.m. at night until 7 in the morning. So 7 in the morning to 7 at night, there is not monitoring of them going on unless they're charged with a domestic violence case. So that's in addition to the 2,600 people on the program that we monitor. There's an additional, as I say, we don't know. We think it could be 1,000 people, but we, we don't know. Um, so the way the pro, and I'm going to wrap this up, Sarah, so I'm, I'm going to over, over here. But really quickly, just to give you really in the weeds real quick, the way it works is if an individual gets arrested, they're in their local police department, they get booked, they get brought over the next morning to the criminal courts building, or the local suburban one, um, and they, they have a bond hearing. The bond hearing has a public defender and state's attorney um, in the room. They lay out the facts of the case, people's backgrounds, and the judge makes the determination of what the bond situation is going to be. At that point, a judge will routinely ask, uh, put someone on home monitoring or, or issue an order for home monitoring, electronic monitoring. What we do then is the individual then leaves the courtroom, goes down to one of our offices, and they make phone calls to see if they can get somebody who agree to let them come into their house with the home monitoring device. We then check all that out. If it all pans out, then we drive the person to the house. We set the bracelet up. We set the monitor in the house up, and then we proceed. We then are monitoring 24-7. We look for violations. Um, if there is a violation, we will then bring the person back into court. Uh, in front of the judge. If it's a new crime, obviously they're arrested. Uh, thankfully, we don't have a lot of crimes that are committed by the majority of the people that are out there, um, but they're then brought back in front of a judge if there's technical violations, and if the technical violations add up, that they're coming in late, there's no explanation of why they weren't at work, things like that, uh, the judges sometimes will bring them into custody then. So that's the, sort of the overview of the program and where we're at now. Um, and as I said, you know, Sarah, I was going to keep this to 10 minutes. I've blown through that already. So I have lots of other stuff here. Um, as I said, we have a program that's very large. It's very labor intensive. We have contractors that work with all different parts of it. We have the University of Chicago helping us as well. Um, and on an average month, we have just under 200 people that we uh, get uh, asked judges to take back into custody is about the average because of technical violations and things along those lines. Um, but those are, I think, the, the, the higher level type of things as well. But as I say, these are all the different aspects of one part of it. As I say, the big part of it is, is that 
We have um, a criminal justice system that has changed in a lot of respects, as they say, from 11,000 in custody down to 5,600. Um, we still have the issues going on and we'll, for the longest time with the length of stay, meaning how long people are sitting in the jail waiting on their trial. Um, as of today, I have two people who have been waiting 11 years for their trial, I think five people waiting 10 years for their trial, another 10 waiting um, like nine years. I mean, it's, there's, we have people that still historic issues that we've always had here. It's still a huge problem with people waiting uh, forever for the trials, which causes additional stresses on the system. Tom, that was great. Thank you so much for that. And as you can imagine, we have received uh, a lot of questions and I'm going to um, read them to you and hopefully we can get through most of them. From Steve W in uh, my district, I think this is on the Williams side, I'm reading all the time that repeat offenders, some of them violent offenders, commit crimes over and over. Are violent offenders being placed on electronic monitoring? And if they are, how many of them are violating their electronic monitoring by going out and committing additional crimes? Uh, we can, I can speak to just the ones that are on my program. Um, as I mentioned, we monitor them 24 hours a day. Um, whatever the number is that's on the chief judge's program, um, I, we don't, I can't speak to that. So I don't know about that group. For ours, uh, we, are, we have a, a special patrol unit that are out scattered throughout the city. So if there are people who leave their houses and are not responsive because the technology is very good. I mean, it is literally the top in the country as far as technology goes in the University of Chicago and Steve Levitt's group. I cannot emphasize enough to you. They've been doing this for years for us now for free. And it's gotta be in the millions of techno technological assistance they've given us. Um, so we're at the top of there, but nonetheless, we still, we don't have people out in front of everyone's houses. We've never contended that we have, nor would we have the money to do that. And with the system itself, it alerts us when people move. There's occasional anomalies, not too often. And then when there is a movement that they're not supposed to do, we contact people, see if there's a reasonable explanation. If not, then we send cars over there and the like. That combined with just the data, um, which the, the vast majority of the people that we have, even the violent people, um, are not recommitting offenses. Um, who's committing all these offenses where people are not being charged? I can only speak to the ones that we're monitoring 24 hours a day. Um, we know if they're around a crime, we track all that. And that's particularly where Steve Levitt's folks have been tremendously helpful with, you know, utilizing their technology and combining it with other uh, crime data to see if people are in the area, things along those lines. And so um, we have not had that type of problem with the electronic monitoring universe of people. You know, I have no information whatsoever. Obviously, if someone's on an I bond, uh, they don't get tracked and they're at home and hopefully, you know, do, going about their lives and doing well and not committing new offenses. But um, obviously, when you have a, um, a rate of solving cases that everyone agrees is so low. I mean, when you look at the crimes that are committed in our city and how few of them are solved, somebody's committing these offenses, obviously. And the, the notions that it's just someone who just routine randomly decided today's my day to commit my first offense, that's somewhat naive. Um, so are these people committing these offenses, people involved with the criminal justice system? Uh, probably there is, there's an argument to be made there. I can only speak factually to the ones that are on EM, and I can tell you that that's something that we are on top of every single day. And when we get any anomalies, if we get any violations, we arrest people if need be, or if not, we take them in front of the judge for the judge to make that determination. But um, it's very frustrating to all of us. As I mentioned before, we're very, very engaged now with policing in the city of Chicago. We're opening up a, a substation in the north, um, the River North area in a week and a half, I think we're opening that up. We're gonna have a permanent police presence down there because we're just, we're trying to help. And we're like a lot of people, we're all looking for all the answers, but it, to make a long answer to your short question, that universe of people on home monitoring 
uh, our data and just the technology is not showing them committing large amounts of offenses. And not that this is any solace whatsoever either. The largest category of offenses that the whole monitoring people do commit are, I guess, somewhat understandable. They're domestic cases. They're, they're getting in domestic issues, sometimes domestic violence, sometimes crimes within the house that they're already in. Got it. That's the largest group. So earlier you talked a little bit about uh, the two-tiered system. Deirdre uh, wrote, although I support criminal justice reform, I believe that data should, should support policy. I read directly from the Appleseed website, which is a criminal justice reform group, that there are essentially two electronic monitoring programs in Cook County. And in October, 2021, um, they, they wrote a facts about electronic monitoring that said the second of Cook County's electronic monitoring program is home confinement, is a home confinement unit run by the adult probation pretrial services division under the offices of the chief judge. Now, I don't think most people know that, know that there's like two programs. Instead of a judge, the pretrial services division makes the determination of who is placed on electronic monitoring um, the, and then she underlines, there is no public information available about the number of people that the electronic monitoring program monitors, how restricted their movements are, what they are charged with, how placement is decided or any other basic information, which is a complete lack of transparency and makes it impossible to analyze the program in any detail. Now, this was right out of the website. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't understand how their Sheriff Dart. I mean, she she goes on to ask Sheriff Dart, no data, no accountability to the public. How can this be true? You know, it sounds like it comes from a foreign country, but uh, she is unfortunately absolutely correct. Um, it's been very, very difficult because uh, uh, two or three years ago, uh, you know, President uh, Preckwinkle who's been, I'll tell you what, during this COVID, I don't know if there's been anybody who's been more helpful uh, to our office than her as far as just with all the COVID issues. She's just been amazing, just so helpful. Um, but two years ago, her and I talked about just the fact that we, in, in the notion that we have two systems and saying, listen, this doesn't make any sense. There's gotta be overlap somewhere and so on. And so, and the Apple seed has been very helpful. There's been an ongoing study uh, um, to see if there's a way to make it one system. And I told people from the very beginning, uh, if they want to take my system over, run, fine. Um, they want me to take it over, fine. I don't care. But just the notion of having two systems to me is illogical and it has to has all sorts of redundancies in it. But getting to the point of the, 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 the woman who just wrote there, um, it, 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 you, there is, it's beyond belief. I mean, I have no idea. I have literally no idea how many people are in that program they say, I vaguely know that they monitor them during just 12 hour windows. I don't know any of the data. And trust me, we have our own issues, but most all of our you know, electronic monitor stuff is online. I mean, it's public information. Unfortunately, Sarah, we have found that um, forever the judiciary has been exempt from the FOIA statute. And so uh, you can't even get it through a Freedom Information Act. And because, and you shouldn't have to do that. We're all in this thing together. I mean, why not tell me how many people you have on? What are the standards? What type of people are on? How long are they on? What technology to use? Do you want to utilize some of mine? Uh, whatever. I just don't really understand it. It makes no sense. It's just not helpful at all. Well, and and so this is pro that's probably a question for us to ask Chief Chief Judge Evans, right? Um, yeah. I'm going to move on, um, and. Uh, we have another question from Michelle. What are the sheriff's responsibilities? I think you went over this. And do you have the power to remove violent offenders from going on to EM? And if like once they're in your, in your custody, um, and if you can't, who can? Well, so once I get, I think I, I think I get the drift of the question. And if not, it's my fault. But I, I, I think that once I get an order uh, from a judge to put a person on home monitoring. The only excuse that's valid for me not putting him or her on home monitoring is that they can't get a house, that they don't have a place that will accept them. Other than that, 
I have to put them out. So even if it's a very serious charge, which I did not agree with, I have to put them out. And as I, I referenced earlier, I was uh, very uncomfortable and very vocal about it uh, when this first started happening. And when I just stopped putting people out, uh, I was taken to federal court and I uh, was forced to then put people out. What I did was, is that A, as I say, Steve Levitt and his group from uh, University of Chicago came on board to help. Um, we attempted to get more uh, personnel, but uh, once again, the, the county board members have been awesome helping us, but we, we are having similar problems, not as severe, mind you, not as severe, but all across the country, law enforcement is having a hard time attracting people. So through attrition, we lose about 40 people a month um, and we're only able to bring on 30 a month as far, not because of finances. No, we have the money. We just can't get the candidates. So because of that, we don't have as many people out in all the different aspects of our office. And home monitoring is one where I'd like to have more out, particularly for people who are charged with violent offenses. Um, the biggest categories that we have, which once again, completely flipped what it used to be, our gun offenders. Those are our largest group. They represent just under 50%, 5-0% of the people on home monitoring are people charged with a gun offense. And that runs the gamut, but the, these are not misdemeanor gun offenses. These are all felony gun offenses. And felony gun offenses include attempted murder? No, that's a separate, separate category. Uh, murder and attempt murder are separate categories. I have about just under a hundred people on home monitoring who are charged with murder. And what? And let's go back to what you were saying about gun offenses. This is just possession of an illegal firearm. It's you know the largest category I have is aggravated unlawful use of a weapon. Um, that's my largest group. Um, and uh, yeah, that, well, it's my second largest group. It, well, almost the same. Felony uh, felon in possession of a weapon is my largest group. So that's a person who's found with a gun who's previously been convicted of a felony. Um, so those two are the top categories. And the third category is the armed, armed habitual criminal. So those three categories together make up about 50% of the people on home monitoring. So um, you were talking a little bit earlier about the wait times for going to trial. So some, we have a- I, uh, I didn't make it up. I wish I did. Mark- asks, what is the average wait time before someone accused of a violent crime on electronic monitoring goes to trial? And how can this time be shortened? What, what is causing? Yeah, that, see, that's a problem too, Sarah, because the reality of it is, is that when you're on home monitoring, so when, when you're held in custody, say in the jail, you're held in custody, every day you're in custody in the jail can go toward your eventual sentence. So if you plead guilty or found guilty later on, that time you spend in the Cook County Jail can be used to mitigate your sentence. So we have loads of cases, loads of cases where they've waited in jail so long with, when their case is disposed of, either by a plea or a trial, they've already done all their time. They've done all that's sitting in Cook County Jail and the Cook County taxpayers dying. And so they literally, we have to put them on a bus, literally. We drive them to Joliet, they get paperwork done in Joliet, and then they're released immediately from Joliet. So we have that on it. Home monitoring has a similar hook to it. You get day for day credit when you're on home monitoring too. And so we had been con contending that when you, we have some people, um, and I have the data here, I, I, I don't know, I have so much data in front of me right now, but um, we have people that will be on home monitoring times for three years. And if their charge is not very serious and the, they've caused no issues with home monitoring during that period of time, there's you know a strong argument made that that should be reviewed, that they shouldn't be collecting day for day time sitting at home. Uh, they should be given an I-bond if they don't present any danger to anybody. Um, so by and large, most of the people on home monitoring aren't on very long. It's not like the people in custody where I have people for 10, 11 years waiting for their trial. The people on home monitoring, by and large, their cases move relatively quickly, but there is a somewhat of a little bit of a disincentive because while you're on home monitoring, you're getting day for day credit and if you know you're going to end up pleading guilty to something and you're looking at a year or two in prison, why not utilize, utilize sitting at home on home monitoring to eat that time up? So, on, and on that note, uh, if you could make changes to the laws around electronic monitoring 
Tom, what would they be? You know, it's, it's, it's all, you know, Sarah, that's where it's all so woven into the, the whole bail statute, bail reform, and so on. Um, and uh, a little less, less than a year from now, you know, um, January 1st of next year, uh, bail reform kicks in full time here in the state. And what that will mean is that you only have two options as a judge. You either hold the person in custody, no, no dollar amount attached, you're just held in custody because you're dangerous, or you're released with no uh, money either. You just walk out the door. They could put conditions on you. They could say you need to have a bracelet on your leg or something like that. But that goes into effect on um, January 1st, um, you know, this in less than a year now. Um, and so that's all woven into it. Because as I said, I was, you know, rather clear and have been clear about the, the serious offenders being put on home monitoring when I actually had the ability to talk to some judges, which mind you, that was always very difficult because a lot of them felt that they couldn't you know, talk with me about these things. Um, they said that the reasoning behind the violent people being put on was because the, the bond laws were forcing them to set bonds for people with violent offenses that they can make and they're getting out and that with home monitoring, at least there was some ability to know that there's somebody watching them. And so, um, any changes we would do in home monitoring would have to be tied into the bail discussions as well uh, and decisions made there. Uh, because clearly, you know, there's different nuances. Anybody who understands the criminal justice world knows it's very nuanced and so on. And I would think that a lot of us could come together and have a complete agreement that there's certain offenses that deserve a different type of analysis than other ones. And for years, I was talking about that as a pretend, primarily, uh, primarily to the mentally ill and to the poor people, because I can't tell you in the old days, in the old days only being seven, six, seven years ago, whatever it was, I had hundreds of people sitting in the jail that needed $50 or $100 to walk out the door and they couldn't come up with it. And they just sat there for months and months and months and months. So there was changes made to make sure we weren't doing that anymore. But now we're on a different side of it where we're now looking at people where we clearly understand there's concerns about their conduct and about what they're charged with, but yet there seems to be an inability to, uh, to hold them. And that, so I, I think anything that we're going to do with uh, in, you know, home monitoring, electronic monitoring would have to be woven into discussions on the bail. So, um, I got another question. It's, you know, that, that's great. I, I know that there's a lot of members on the phone right now. On the, some of the hosts are taking some serious looking at, you know, trying to get home monitoring modified. And there's a lot of discussion about who should and shouldn't be on. I mean, you had said earlier that uh, there's some people who, who could be taken off because they've not you know, they were more petty offenses, nonviolent, and they've been, you know, they've gotten good time for it. Um, also, but, you know, we're taking a really, you know, not having data from uh, Judge Evans' office really is a problem. It doesn't because help. It doesn't how, can help. We, how can we write a law that's fair and balanced, okay, if we don't know what we're dealing with? Anyway, um, there are people charged with crimes who are uh, put on electronic monitoring, who simply disappear from electronic and are never heard from. Why does this happen? What's being done to prevent it and in the future? Um, we, I mean, obviously, as I said, uh, we don't have the ability, nor do we purport to tell anybody that, that we have the ability to have cars out in front of everyone's houses. When we have the more serious offenders, but unfortunately, when we first started getting the real serious offenses, there was just a handful of them. And I literally did put a car out in front of those houses. But then once the number got to be where, you know, as I say, it's well over um, like 80, 75 to 80 percent of my the, the, the people on home monitoring are charged with a violent offense. Um, I obviously don't have that ability anymore. So we have uh, the ability to find most people who take off. We don't have many that do take off, but when they do, we have a unit that's specifically charged with going after those individuals. And we've partnered for years with the Great Lakes uh, Marshall uh, Task Force, which has been very helpful as well. So we do have a tendency uh, to have 
a walls, but they'll be gone for days and we'll get them back in custody. Uh, and people will cut the straps off their thing. The, the, the straps being cut, it's harder and harder to do that because the technology has changed somewhat, uh, but they can still cut them off. Uh, and so we then charge them with a new offense for escape and things like that. But even that law just got changed too, Sarah, where uh, for us to charge someone with escape from home monitoring, now they have to be gone for at least 48 hours, which frankly, we would usually go after, we still go after them right away. But now if we catch them quicker, we can't charge them with escape. It's just, it's sort of confounding um, that, why that could change that way. But um, so we do have uh, go out and after people, uh, we have people that have been AWOL from the program. The largest group of people AWOL um, have been gone for over six, they, because the program's so old, they've been gone for 16, 20 years ago they left. Wow. Um, and many of them uh, left the country over those periods of times and so on. But the ones in the last you know, five, 10 years or so, those are ones we tend to catch pretty quickly. And they have not been the ones that have been out causing a lot of these issues or problems. Um, the people that have taken off, we do catch them and usually pretty quickly. I have one more question that I want to run by you. Uh, and it, it's a question about the bond hearing. It comes from a woman named Susan on Lakeshore Drive. She, she asked, what role does a state's attorney play during the bonding process? I'm not really clear on this concept, but um, apparently the, it's, the state's attorney has to file uh, a petition to detain for no bail, uh, and that the court the court has to take direction from the state's attorney. So, yeah, you know, I, I used to be a state's attorney many years ago, uh, and things have changed. Uh, so, the in, during the in actual bond hearing, and mind you, I don't go down to them. Um, it doesn't serve a real purpose, but the uh, traditionally, traditionally, the bond hearing would occur, they usually occur in the morning, early afternoon, uh, and you would have the defendant brought up, the public defender usually goes downstairs into the lockup area, interviews the defendant beforehand, gets basic information, so on and so forth. The defendant then comes up in front of the judge, that public defender is there to represent them, to make a pitch as to, you know, this individual has a job, it's their first offense, uh, they, they, they can post $100, things like that. Uh, the state's attorney is in the courtroom as well. The state's attorney usually would have the rap sheet and say, judge, this person has this many offenses. This person was convicted. This person's on parole. Uh, we believe this person should be held. Um, the state's attorney's office has the ability to file a petition, it's called, in certain cases, not all cases, just in certain cases, they can file a petition for no bail. Um, and they do that. I don't know when. I'm not in court to do that. But that's something option that's there that can be done. I honestly couldn't tell you if it's done, not done, I've done all the time. I, I just don't know, but that is part of the process. But the, even if it's done, the, the, the court makes the decision. The state's attorney does not make the decision at all. I mean, um, the state's attorney could be jumping up and down, yelling and screaming, saying this person needs to be held. And a judge could just feel differently and say, I don't believe that. And so I'm going to let this person go out on the following type of conditions or something. So uh, it's, it's a misnomer to, to attach to the state's attorney this, uh, any role other than, frankly, just advocating for the state saying this is what we feel based on this charge and so on would to do. But there is the, your, your, um, the individual who wrote to you is absolutely correct. There is this petition, but it's just a petition that they can file in limited cases that then would be considered by the judge as to why they would grant no bond. But it is a state's attorney that determines the charge. They do, yes, yes. And most, most charges, there's a handful of ones they don't, but by and large, all the ones that are of significance, there's a unit called felony review. And that's been around even um, since when I was a state's attorney where the police department will call them up or they'll send a state's attorney out to the police station and they'll, the police officer will lay out what she has as far as the case and says, this is what I have on this individual. I'm looking for charges of um, yeah, armed robbery. And the state's attorney will say, okay, sounds good. And they sign off and the charges off go. The state's attorney may say, listen, we need you to talk to one more witness beforehand, but this looks good. 
And so they're basically like almost like a legal consultant, but they are the sort of gatekeepers. It will be the ones that will decide whether or not the charges are filed or not, because if they don't, just there's just bizarre anomalies where the police can go around them. Um, but it really is, that's their role and has been for years that they're the gatekeepers on whether charges are approved or not. Well, this has been very, very eye-opening. And I, um, we, I'm trying to hold to my promise of 45 minutes. We have uh, many, many qu more questions that require answers and we will manage them once uh, we take a look at them after we end this. But Tom, I really want to thank you for your historical um, sort of 101 presentation. I think it was very eye-opening. I'm not sure that a lot of people understood that there are two very different uh, programs, one of which uh, electronic monitoring programs, one of which we have no idea what the data is. And, you know, the simple fact that you tell us it's old technology and it's only for 12 hours a day is, you know, just sort of gives me pause. Um, and I wish we knew a little bit more moving forward so that we could um, remediate because in general, it sounds like you have a successful program. Yeah, and you know, we will have our issues, we will have our problems, yes, because of the nature of humans. Humans are not predictable by nature. And so can someone commit an offense in the house? Yes, and that does occur, it does occur, absolutely. Can they run out of the house and commit an offense? Yes, can they run out and just take off? Yeah, they can. Um, so it's not precise. That's why when I've been so opposed to people with violent charges being on home monitoring, it's because of the unpredictable nature of it, because the public rightfully would say, well, based on this person's charge, didn't that alert you that this person was more dangerous than a drug offender? And that was the notion, Sarah, for all those years when the program was almost exclusively drug offenders. It was like, barring something bizarre, all they're going to do if they take off is they're going to go out and self-harm. They're going to go buy narcotics or something, and we'll eventually find them again, and they're only you know, basically hurting themselves. Um, that's where it's, it's this, this different population. And uh, as they say, President Preckwinkle's office has been awesome. And they're working on trying to figure out a way of maybe combining the programs or things along those lines. So uh, she's been working diligently on it, but she runs in the same hurdles that I do as well, though. Well, Tom, we are going to wrap it up. You are a, just a plethora of information. And um, this is why it pays to have some longevity. You have, uh, you know. Yeah. When right. you start talking about this historical stuff, I'm starting to get this impression you and I might be getting old. No, you might. I'm not. <laughs> I have a picture up in my attic. Yeah. Uh, but I just want to thank you. I know that all of our um, legislators and aldermen are also very, very grateful for your input. And it will give us um, some food for thought as we move forward when we. Um, continue our track to find more truth and get more information about what we should and should, should be doing before uh, we move forward on portions of other laws. And, and is there anything I can do to help going forward for anybody, um, period? I mean, and whether it's the people on the panel, um, the elected officials or the public, just please reach out to us. We're around all the time. Terrific. Good seeing you. Great seeing you too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Thank you, Margaret and Rob and Ann and Alderman Hopkins. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Jamie Andrade, Tom Honey, Scott Wogspack, uh, and Michelle Smith and all our um, um, amazing legislators. Have a great evening and thank you.